In this lecture, we're going to review some of the basic ideas behind linear time invariant systems. And linear time invariant is abbreviated LTI. Now, beginning with a system, that can be defined as a device that maps an input signal to an output signal. And systems are used uh, quite widely in signal processing. So schematically, we would have a draw something like this, where the box represents the system. We'll call that H. And there's an input, say, X of T. Or we might have a discrete time input, X of N. And then on the output side, we get some signal, say, Y of T. Or we might get a discrete time output, Y of N. Now, I can have a system that generates, takes a continuous time input and generates a discrete time output, or vice versa. And we'll study those kind of systems. Now, just to refresh your memory on notation, continuous time signals are denoted with parentheses. So I'll put a parentheses around the independent variable, and that denotes that we're in continuous time. And if I sketch one of those, we'll have our axis t here, and let's label this point zero, and the signal could do a variety of things, but it it's defined everywhere, and we'll label the amplitude here as, say, one. In contrast, a the discrete time signal we are going to denote using square brackets and so we'll have x of n and typically we'll use uh, n or k as an index uh, for the independent variable and this is defined only on integer values of n so if i have axis here n, we'll make this uh, 0, and then let's say we have some point here. It's difficult to draw these as stem plots to emphasize the fact that they're only defined at discrete points or values in time. You might have this, the amplitude here be 1, and then we've got 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. This would be minus 2, would be the index. So that's a discrete time signal. Now systems have two different uh, purposes that we often use them for in signal processing. We can use a system to model a physical phenomena, and I'll give you an example of that. Or we can use a system to uh, implement some desired characteristic to a system. So let's draw a little picture here. Suppose we have a simplified communication system and I have my base station here and it's transmitting some signal to uh, a, a cell phone located somewhere in the range and uh, excuse my art on the cell phone but uh, and we have let's suppose we have a uh, a building or some other object in the vicinity and so this what happens at the cell phone is that the signal which is transmitted by the base station there's a path that goes directly to the phone and then there's also a path that gets reflected off this large object nearby and arrives at the phone. We're going to assume just for simple illustration here that what we see coming directly from the base station is x of t, and what we observe coming off of the building is an attenuated by some factor b and delayed version of that signal x of t minus tau. What I observe at what I measure at the cell phone is some signal y of t, which is x of t plus b x of t minus tau. So in this case, we can think of this as a system. We have a mapping from, say, an input x of t to an output y of t. And this system is a model for what's happening physically here. Now, if we want to uh, recover the original signal x of t, we need to do some processing to implement some characteristic to this signal. 
And let's model that with some, or describe that by h. And here I'm going to put in y of t. And let's say what we get out is z of t. And the question is, can we recover x of t from this uh, mix of signals x of t plus b x of t minus tau? Well, it turns out that you can if you let, and we'll, I'll try to convince you this, if I let, let z of t be equal to y of t minus b y of t minus tau plus b squared y of t minus 2 tau minus b cubed y of t minus 3 tau plus b to the fourth y of t minus 4 tau and so on. And I've written this vertically because we'll sh demonstrate that this works on the other side. I'm going to write out y of t here as x of t plus b x of t minus tau. And then I'll have, I'm going to subtract off b times y of t minus tau. So that's minus b. And then I'll have x of t minus tau um, minus b squared x of t minus 2 tau. Then for the b squared term, I'm going to be adding in plus b squared times y of t minus 2 tau. Well, that's going to first involve b squared x of t minus 2 tau. And we'll have plus b cubed x of t minus 3 tau. And then when we have the b cubed term, we're going to have minus b cubed uh, x of t minus 3 tau plus b to the fourth, I'm sorry, that's uh, minus b to the fourth, x of t minus 4 tau. And that's probably enough to see the pattern here. What, so what happens when I combine these delayed and amplitude shifted versions of my output is that I cancel out the echo term. So I'm going to first cancel out b x of t minus tau, those cancels. Well, when I do that cancellation, I introduce another echo, minus b squared x of t minus 2 tau. Well, that'll be canceled by the next term that I add in. And as I continue adding terms in, b cubed x of t minus 3 tau, I get that canceled out, and so on. Eventually, I'm going to cancel out more and more terms. Now, for this to work, we're going to have to, you can see that we're going to have to have b have magnitude less than 1, right? Because if because we've got b, b squared, b cubed, b fourth. If b is magnitude less than 1, then this is going to be decreasing. If it were greater than 1, it would be increasing, and that would be a problem. So eventually, we have some term over here, which is very small. It's delayed long ways, and we effectively have used our system to implement a desired characteristic to the signal. We remove the echo. So what does it mean for a system to be linear? Well, basically, it means that superposition holds. In other words, a sum of inputs produces a corresponding sum of outputs. So if I have over here, let's suppose I have x1 of n goes into a system h, and it generates y1 of n. And I have x2 of n goes into the same system, and when it does, it generates y2 of n. Then a linear system would have the property that if I put as an input a times x1 of n plus b times x2 of n, what I end up getting out of such a system is a times y1 of n plus b times y2 of n. This is a very powerful property. It obviously only holds within limits, because if a or b go to infinity, then you know an amplifier is going to saturate, or something's going to fail, and this isn't going to work. But over a wide range of inputs, if this holds, this is extremely powerful. Now, we're going to complement that with the idea of time invariance. And a time invariant system responds the same no matter when you apply the input to it or test it. So it responds identically uh, now as it does later. OK, 
characteristics of the system are not changing with time. So if I put in a, an input uh, x of n, and that generates a output y of n, then a time invariant system is going to satisfy the property that I can delay the input by any amount that I want and all that does is it produces the equivalent output delayed in time. Now a system that satisfies both of these properties is said to be linear and time invariant. Okay, that satisfies both. Again, these properties can are only approximate. I mean, this says that if I uh, have some MP3 player now and then I wait to use it in 10 billion years, that it's going to work the same as it does now. And obviously that's, that's not true. Things fail, things break, things don't last. So um, time invariance, again, is with respect to some limited uh, time horizon that's of interest to us. Now, it turns out that for linear time invariant systems have a very straightforward input-output relationship. And my I slash O there means input-output. And that is the impulse response tells all everything we need to know. If you know that, you don't need to know anything else. So the impulse response of a system is the output in response to an impulse input, which we usually denote with the symbol delta. And remember, an impulse is 1 at time 0, and it's 0 at all other times. I'm drawing the discrete time case. The continuous time case is a little more complicated because of the definition of a continuous time impulse. But if I put delta then into my system, what I get out of my system is, by definition, the impulse response. And we'll typically denote this by h of n. And so I might get something out that, you know, it, it, it lingers for some time. And so if I know how the system behaves to, the, to an impulse input and the system is linear and time invariant, then I can determine how the system responds to any input x of n. So if I have x of n as an input, then what I'm going to get out is y of n, which is the so-called convolution of x of n with h of n. And we can write this convolution out. The asterisk here, remember, is the operator notation. What the asterisk means is that I'm going to take the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of x of k times h of n minus k. It turns out that this operation can be, it commutes, doesn't matter what order you do it in, so it's also the same as from k equals minus infinity to infinity of h of k x of n minus k. And, which I can of course also write as h of n convolved with x of n. This is so-called convolution sum. A similar formula exists for continuous time systems. In that case, we have a con convolution integral. Now, I'm assuming you've seen convolution before and may even have spent a fair bit of time actually manually computing these infinite sums using graphical techniques and so on. Uh, our emphasis here is going to be more on using the convolution to get the output of the system. Now, what is it what does it mean for a system to be causal? Well, causal means that the system can't respond before the input starts. Okay, there's a cause and effect in place that the, when the input begins, that causes something to happen in the output. So this implies that the impulse response has to be zero for n less than zero. I can't get an output before my impulse arrives. There's another property that's sometimes useful here, and that is the idea that a system is stable. We say the system is stable in the bounded input, bounded output sense if any bounded input will guarantee to produce a bounded output. And that's a little more complicated. Some of you may remember this, that for a system, discrete time system to be stable, 
it has to be what's called absolutely summable. And that is, if I take the sum of the absolute values of all the impulse responses, that those are finite. Well, a very important class of linear time invariant systems can be described in terms of difference equations. Recall that difference equations are the discrete time version of differential equations. In particular, if the system has linear constant coefficients, then it fits into the L time LTI system class. So this is very important for us in signal processing. So we're going to have linear constant coefficient difference equations. I can write this down in general, the sum from k equals 0 to n of a k y of n minus k is equal to the sum k equals 0 to m of b k x of n minus k. This is a general form of a linear constant coefficient difference equation. It has capital N terms in the past of y and capital M terms in the past of x which is the input. Now these difference equations are used, we're going to use them for several purposes and in signal processing they're commonly used to model physical systems like the effect of a suspension system on a bump that you hit can be modeled this way. Uh, they're commonly used for designing and we'll look at this in detail filters and they're also used for implementing or I'll say compute filters. So if I want to filter some data I can use a difference equation like this to impart the filtering characteristic to that data. Some simple examples uh, I could write say y of n minus one half y of n minus one is equal to x of n and you can see that what this means is that I can also write y of n is equal to one half y of n minus one plus x of n. Now if I wanted to find the impulse response of this system I would put in uh, delta of n so I'll let x of n be equal to delta of n and then I'm going to assume that the system is at rest. In other words when I start this process it's not doing anything so will denote the at rest condition by y of minus 1 being equal to 0. So you can substitute these into this, this form of the equation which is more useful for computation. And I can find that the impulse response, let's, let's just write it out in terms of y. So uh, y of 0, the first value, is going to be 1 half times 0 plus 1. So that's 1. And then y of 1 will just be 1 half times 1 plus 0 because the impulse is now gone. And that's, of course, 1 half. And you can see that y of 2 is equal to 1 half times 1 half plus 0, which is equal to 1 fourth, and so on. What happens to the impulse response is it never really dies out. It, it decays as one half to some power. So if I were going to do a convolution, I'd need to have an infinite number of terms, but this difference equation actually allows me to do the computation recursively in a very, very simple manner. I just have to multiply one half times the previous output plus the input. So they're very useful for implementing filters.